It's the Maxwell Institute Podcast. Thanks for listening. I'm your host, Blair Hodges. This is part two of my interview with historian Paul Reeve, author of the new book, Religion of a Different Color, Race and the Mormon Struggle for Whiteness. In this episode, Paul discusses the origins of the LDS Church's restriction on priesthood ordination and temple attendance against black church members. Independent historian Artis Partial, who co-edited a one-volume encyclopedia on Mormonism, joins us to talk about the value of lesser-known Latter-day Saint stories. Paul and Artis also reflect on how they negotiate difficult issues posed by church history in their own religious faith. It's Paul Reeve and Artis Partial on the book Religion of a Different Color in this episode of the Maxwell Institute Podcast. How did the ban come about? Let's talk about the priesthood restriction against blacks. Black men could not hold the priesthood and and could not attend the temple. And so likewise, black Mormon women would then be excluded from the temple as well. So Joseph Smith, what was his part in that? So there were at least two black men who were a danger to the priesthood in the first uh, 20 years of, of Mormonism. And no evidence to date of Joseph Smith ever making a race-based priesthood restriction statement or a race-based temple restriction statement. It simply doesn't exist in any known um, articulation by Joseph Smith. Uh, And evidence is that, in fact, there is this open uh, male priesthood and open um, notions of temple admission uh, in the first 20 years of, of Mormonism. Uh, that starts to deteriorate, uh, you know, I think around ideas, uh, uh, once again, associated with race mixing. You have to understand how much Americans fear the mixing of the races, and once again, democracy is at stake if races mix. Uh, it's a deterioration away from whiteness. And uh, you have a couple of cases that come to the leadership's attention um, in the uh, you know, in 1847 in particular, sort of this crucial year, um, in 1847, you, you have, I think, sort of uh, the, the high point of uh, Mormon universal notions and some of those notions expressed by Brigham Young himself in, in the spring of 1847. And by uh, the end of 1847, you have um, then a more kind of fearful notions based on notions of race mixing being expressed by Brigham Young. So Brigham, initially, for example, he was praising a black member of the church who he knew had the priesthood, right? That's exactly right. And it's important, I think, for Mormons to know this, right? Um, sometimes the racial restriction is is simply dismissed as Brigham Young's own internal racism. Uh, and I think we need to understand that Brigham Young is also complicated, right? It's, it's too easy just to chalk it up to somehow Brigham Young is inherently racist. Because he's on record in 1847 with an open racial attitude towards priesthood. And he is on record of being favorably aware of Q. Walker Lewis as a black priesthood holder. The hierarchy is aware of Q. Walker Lewis. He's a member of the Low Massachusetts branch. He's a black man. He's a radical abolitionist. And he is a Mormon elder. And Brigham Young is on record. These are official church minutes where he is um, articulating a favorable awareness of Q. Walker Lewis as a black man and as a priesthood holder. And so uh, he also, um, in in a meeting with another black Mormon, uh, William or or sometimes Warner McCary, uh, he says color doesn't matter. Okay, and that um, all races come from one blood, and he's tapping into sort of New Testament notions. Uh, and uh, he's arguing against sort of the polygenesis theory that um, is permeating 19th century American racial thought that, in fact, maybe the races came from two different, uh, you know, uh, creations. And so this polygenesis or more than one genesis, more than one creation. And Brigham Young argues against that. The human family is all connected and color doesn't matter to us. And we have a black elder and African uh, in low Massachusetts. Uh, so that's 1847, and Brigham Young is on record as favorably aware of that. So, uh, you know, any notions that it's just simply um, inherent racism in Brigham Young, I think, needs to be challenged. Now, certainly he will say all kinds of terribly racist things in 1852 when he openly announces 
a priesthood restriction. But I'm only making the point that it's um, too simplistic to simply dismiss this as a somehow um, Brigham Young as being inherently racist. So what happens then between the late 1840s when he's making positive comments and uh, 1852 when he's speaking to the Utah legislature, territorial legislature, and and making incredibly offensive remarks? Uh, so, you know, he's he's dealing with reports that uh, uh, Q. Walker Lewis's son Enoch is married to a white woman and they have a child together and they're um, Mormons in the Massachusetts branch. So race mixing is something that Mormon leaders were consistently against, Joseph Smith, uh, as well as Brigham Young and as well as other Mormon leaders across the course of the 19th century and 20th centuries as well. Uh, that makes them more American than it does anything uniquely Mormon. The vast majority of states have um, laws on the books um, against race mixing. So they sort of blend on those counts. Um, and Brigham Young becomes aware of those ca- uh, cases. He speaks out um, pretty dramatically when he uh, meets in, in December of 1847 and learns firsthand of Q. Walker Lewis's son Enoch being married to uh, Mary Webster in the Low Massachusetts branch, so a black white interracial marriage. He speaks out forcefully against it. He says capital punishment should be the penalty. Uh, But there is no mention of priesthood in any of those minutes. And so I'm really hesitant. I I think you you see sort of a transition that's taking place. But um, priesthood is not mentioned by Brigham Young in the surviving minutes. And there are only 13 lines of, of those minutes. And so I think it's important that historians don't sort of overreach from what we can conclude from those minutes. You do have earlier in the year Parley Pratt, who does make um, a statement about a racial priesthood restriction. So it's the first known statement from a Mormon leader. That's 1847. He's responding to William McCary, who's leading a schismatic group by this point. He's another black man. And um, Parley Pratt makes the first known statement uh, from a Mormon leader about a race-based priesthood restriction, he seems to be drawing upon the book of Abraham. And when Brigham Young makes his um, statement, it's based on the the biblical curse of Cain. And I find no evidence whatsoever that anyone uh, remembers back to Parley Pratt's statement. The most of the Quorum of the Twelve are in the Great Basin. Uh, this is 1847 when they're leaving, uh, you know, the United States and coming to the the Great Basin. Uh, so there's no precedent that I can see established by Pratt's statement. Really, then we're at 1852, and Brigham Young is responding to then the group of people that have gathered to the Great Basin. It's once again the universalism of early Mormonism has uh, uh, brought. <laughs> a wide group of people to the basin. It includes freed blacks, it includes black slaves, it includes slaveholders, it includes abolitionists, it includes anti-abolitionists. These are people who have political positions on par with um, political positions that are available uh, you know, amongst the general population. They've now gathered to the Great Basin. How do we create order out of this racial group? And you can think of it, um, you know, in Book of Mormon terms. Uh, All are alike unto God, black and white, bond and free, the Book of Mormon says. But in 1852, they're going to have to sort that out. And white will take precedence over black, and free will take precedence over bond. And uh, it's sort of those conditions on the ground in 1852 that will produce the first open articulation of a race-based priesthood restriction from a Mormon prophet. And was that advanced as explicitly a revelation? Is there any suggestion that Brigham said, you know, I received this straight from God, this is the way it is, or? Brigham Young does not make that claim. Um, And I I should say I, I deconstruct his 5th of February 1852 speech I think more extensively than um, has appeared in print, uh, at least to this date, and uh, really try to ferret out what this means. Most scholars to this point have quoted Wilford Woodruff's very truncated summary, and that summary includes um, In the Name of Jesus Christ. Uh, We went back uh, to the original Pittman shorthand version, uh, which is a much longer version. Woodruff is trying to sort of copy this down in his um, in his record just uh, longhand and he gets about 800 words and 
the speech is is you know three times as long. And um, so I think he makes some some important errors in his summary, and scholars have largely relied upon Woodruff up to the to this point. And I think it's better to go back to the Pittman shorthand version and the transcript that Watt actually makes from that has been available to scholars. And, uh, you know, Brigham Young does make some forceful statements. He says, if no other prophet or apostle said it before now, I say it, that um, black people are the children of Cain. He says, I know it, and I know that they can't hold the priesthood. So he's very forceful, and he, um, you know, evokes his um, prophetic mantle, but he doesn't say, um, you know, that he received a revelation. He doesn't claim that. It's something that's not ever canonized in Mormon scripture. Uh, And in fact, by the end of his speech, he actually backs away from even his more forceful notions by saying, well, I realize that other people may disagree with me. And I think he's actually referring to Orson Pratt because Pratt— I was going to ask about that. What Brigham wasn't just saying what everyone already thought. There there were people, including in the Quorum of the Twelve, who— didn't appreciate it. That's right, and and that's an important piece of context that um, you know I, I bring out in this book. Um, we um, uncovered some speeches that had never been transcribed from the fifty two territorial legislature. One by Orson Pratt and one by uh, Orson Spencer. And Orson Pratt speaks out against the servant code that the legislature is is contemplating in this debate and. Uh, he doesn't because there were some slaves in Utah. So that's they right. Were... So they're they're really trying to um, create a law that will um, govern what the relationship will be between white masters and their black slaves who have been brought. These are uh, Mormons who are converted from uh, the South, and they have brought their slaves with them to Utah Territory. What does this mean? What laws will govern this relationship? And that's the debate that produces uh, these speeches. And historians really hadn't laid out a timeline before, and, and I really wanted to understand um, when the speeches were given, uh, in response to what bills were they given, and we now have a really firm timeline of events that are associated with the territorial legislature, and it is in response to these debates that you have Brigham Young uh, forcefully and openly announcing a priesthood restriction, but it also seems to be in context of a debate with Orson Pratt, and Pratt is speaking out against, he doesn't want this um, servant code passed. And he, uh, Brigham Young makes a distinction between servant and slave, and really there is a legal distinction. And Mm -hmm. Brigham Young is on firm ground legally, if you understand 19th century labor relations. But Pratt just says, you know, it doesn't matter. Um, We're we're not treating them equal. And uh, he argues strongly against the servant code that the legislature is debating, and he argues against the notion that curses are multi-generational, that God can perhaps curse people, but that applies to the generation he curses. It doesn't pass down to succeeding generations. And it's really a singular argument that Pratt makes on that count. He doesn't mention priesthood in his argument. He's really debating um, this the servant code, but nonetheless, the curse, Ham's curse, uh, Noah's curse upon um, Ham's son Canaan, um, isn't a multi-generational kind of a thing. And God may give curses, but they don't uh, necessarily pass down. And uh, Brigham Young rejects that idea and argues for a race-based priesthood restriction as well as for a servant code to govern um, blacks who have been brought to Utah Territory as slaves. So this is when we get a policy uh, in the LDS Church about blacks and the priesthood and about uh, black people and the temple. And the problem is, is you still have some Mormons who are black and who have the priesthood, what is their fate? Well, so, um, you know, ironically, Key Walker Lewis is in Utah Territory when this debate is taking place, and it's incredibly frustrating as a historian. Um, you know, I, I contacted um, my my friends. Um, you know, I said, what do we, what can we ferret out? I contacted artists. She's just an artist partial. She's a, and we're going to hear from her later, but um, she's, just a, a remarkable historian who seems to be able to um, find people um, who are unfindable. And, um, you know, we, we know that Kiwaka Lewis was in Utah Territory. Um, what scrap of evidence is there? I mean, how can he show up and there not be any sort of scrap of evidence? And really the major scrap of evidence is that he received his patriarchal blessing. Uh, we know he's 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 in Utah Territory, but then he's back in Massachusetts by the end of 1852. 
Uh, and really what's, what's missing is his response to all this. We know he's a radical black abolitionist. He's an immediate abolitionist. In other words, he's arguing for black uh, equality and black slavery should be eradicated and it should be immediate and black should be um, equal in, in society. And certainly if he's aware that these debates were taking place and the position that the Utah Territorial Legislature takes and the law that they pass, it certainly must have been chilling for him and really incredibly disappointing. But we just don't know um, his response. We do know that he returns to Massachusetts. Does he stay in the faith? No idea. His wife has him um, buried in the uh, Episcopal Church, the the religion to which she belongs. Um, Does he remain faithful to Mormonism? I wish I knew um, that he dies in 1856. So then the lone priesthood holder is is Elijah Abel. And um, if, if, if Joseph S. Smith's later remembrance is, is valid, Elijah Abel applies to Brigham Young for his temple ordinances, um, endowment, and sealing. He had been washed and anointed in the Kirtland Temple, but was not in Nauvoo when the later ordinances were introduced. And so um, he may have applied to Brigham Young. What we do know is that in 1879, because it survives in the historical record, he makes application to John Taylor. And that produces an investigation by the highest levels of the LDS leadership. And so, you know, for me, that investigation is important simply because if the restriction is unambiguously in place, why does, uh, you know, the leader of Mormonism need to conduct an investigation? Um, And so it indicates to me that still, um, even though you have these very forceful statements, it's not solidified in in the minds even of the leadership. What does this mean that we have a black priesthood holder and that he wants his endowment and that he wants to be sealed to his wife like everyone else because these are the highest ordinances of his faith? That's when you show the discussions happening among LDS leaders after Brigham Young where there is a lot of confusion, a lot of mistaken memory, um, conflicting statements about whether he was ever ordained, conflicting statements about whether that ordination was rescinded, um, conflicting statements about what the original ordination meant or whether it was valid, and there are all these different opinions kind of circulating, so they don't have necessarily this set policy. It's still kind of in the process of getting formulated. Um, but Elijah Abel passes away um, without having received his endowment. And um, there's a quote that I wanted to read here from the book where you, that kind of talks about what happened after that. Um, With Elijah Abel dead, the priesthood ban as an a priori assumption hardened even more into something real and tangible in the minds of its creators. Shaped and molded by men, baked in the desert sun of accumulated precedent, and the heat of distant memories, and then laid at God's feet as if no human hands had touched it. This gets at the idea that that restriction comes to be understood as somehow divine. Yeah, that's right. And and for me, you know, that's that's kind of the tragic part of this this story is is that it just sort of grows over time. It accumulates, um, you know, this growing precedent in the minds of of the leadership. They're not willing to violate the precedent established by previous leaders, even though the restriction itself is a violation of the precedent established by Joseph Smith. Um, and so it sort of just grows in their uh, minds, and then you sort of read the minutes of these meetings between 1879 and 1908, where I think this dynamic is playing out. And, uh, you know, they're sometimes remembering back to Brigham Young and sometimes remembering back to Joseph Smith. And an important part of this process is sort of also including Joseph Smith. If it was there from the beginning, God must have put it in place, and man can't do anything about it, and it's going to take a revelation to get rid of it. And in fact, that's what happens. But it's sort of um, a self-reinforcing kind of argument that they get themselves into, and also colored by these um, distant memories and misremembrances, and uh, it starts to crystallize and um, becomes increasingly solid. And I basically argue that, you know, um, the last brick in this wall of racial restriction is in place in 1908 when Joseph F. Smith misremembers that Elijah Abel's priesthood was declared null by Joseph Smith himself. 
And so what you have to do is you have to erase the black priesthood holders from collective Mormon memory so that the new memory going forward is um, a memory of uncomplicated whiteness. And that takes place in 1908 when Elijah Abel as a black priesthood holder is effectively um, erased from collective Mormon memory. That's when you, I mean, you're right that the, the price of Mormon whiteness was partially paid by uh, Mormons distancing themselves from, from blackness. Um, that opens up a theological vacuum because now you have this uh, policy in place that's become thought of as a eternal truth or some sort of godly mandate. What sort of, um, what sort of things then fill in that gap of why that ban existed? So you start to have, um, appearing in the historical record, other explanations. Um, you know, this is an, another important thing um, that I, I hope readers sort of recognize is that Brigham Young uh, only draws upon the curse of Cain for his justification. That's the idea that Cain killed Abel, so God put a mark on him. And cool. that mark is, according to Brigham Young, black skin. And, and by the way, not just Brigham, but a, uh, that was a fairly common Protestant sort of Thing. Yeah, it's a part of the broader Judeo-Christian tradition um, that predates Mormonism um, uh, and sort of a, a, a common understanding. Of, so he locates it there. So, so Brigham Young locates the, the restriction there. Cain killed Abel. He tried to usurp Abel's uh, place in this broader chain of being, um, this sort of interconnected human network. Um, because of that, um, because of his attempt to usurp another patriarch's place in this broader um, chain of belonging, then um, descendants of Cain, who Brigham Young understands as black people, will have to wait until all of Abel's posterity receive the priesthood. And it's this very ambiguous kind of notion that um, who are Abel's descendants? Uh, how will we know when they all receive the priesthood? Did that finally happen in 1978? I mean, it raises all kinds of really complicated questions. Um, but nonetheless, Brigham Young only resorts to that. He never deviates from that. He never draws upon the Book of Abraham. He never draws upon a less valiant in the pre-existence narrative. Those are other explanatory tools that crop up, but it's never given by Brigham Young, the person who establishes the priesthood restriction, as the reason for doing so. Brigham Young is consistent. It's the curse of Cain. And so you have then um, leaders who will start to draw upon the Book of Abraham, um, you know, Pharaoh's uh, cursed descendant, um, as one idea. Um, and so by the time that President McKay is leader, he says, um, we believe we have scriptural justification. And some people think he might be referring to, uh, or, or I guess there's, I've had students in my class who think, well, maybe he's referring to the Book of Mormon in this um, skin of blackness, right? That's not what he's referring to. He's referring to the Book of Abraham. And that became one explanatory tool. The other explanatory tool was, um, black people were neutral in the war in heaven, um, this pre-earth-like war that they refer to um, drawing upon uh, the book of Revelation in the New Testament, um, and that because they were neutral, um, that ensured that they were born into a cursed lineage, um, and that um, cursed lineage included a priesthood restriction. And then, um, you know, Brigham Young tries to dismiss notions of of neutrality for anyone in an 1869 meeting, uh, he says no one was neutral. He never buys into this argument. He says no one was neutral. Uh, everyone took sides. Um, and then he just reasserts it's the curse of Cain. Um, but that doesn't mean that um, future leaders don't resort to that as an explanation. And so you have, especially at the turn of the century, early 20th century, throughout, uh, you know, um, you know, the first half of the 20th century, this is an explanatory tool. It shifts from neutrality to less valiant. Yeah. Um, and so you have other Mormon leaders who will use that as a justification um, to explain the priesthood restriction. Yeah, you, you bookend it really interesting with Joseph Fielding Smith. There's a, a statement in one of his publications from 1907 where he says, there is nothing in our standard works nor any authoritative statement to the effect that one-third of the hosts of heaven remained neutral in the great conflict and that the colored races are of that neutral class. So he says that's not the case. This is not the official position of the church. Uh, and then you have him in 1931, I believe, so this is not too long after, saying that uh, some premortal spirits were not valiant as a result of their lack of obedience, 
blacks came to earth under restrictions. And then Bruce R. McConkie places that justification in Mormon doctrine in 1958, and then that barely went out of print five years ago. Uh, and so you, you see Joseph Fielding Smith sort of morphing a little bit on that question. Yeah, that's right. So he moves away from neutrality to less value, and it, uh, you know, it's sort of a subtle shift, but, um, you know, it, it's a way to sort of account for Brigham Young's position, um, but also to then say that uh, somehow agency was involved. Because Brigham Young's Curse of Cain, the problem there is that it violates this fundamental Mormon principle of agency. How can you simply um, deny people uh, access to saving rituals simply because of their skin color and for um, the murder that they had no part in? And it's this multi-generational curse. And Mormonism uh, is uh, fundamentally based upon this principle of, of human agency, and you're removing the ability of agency from these people. And, and you know, when the first presidency makes a race-based uh, statement in 1907, they, said, they say it doesn't matter how worthy a person is. No, no one with a drop of the blood of Cain in them can hold a priesthood or, or attend the temple. And so, uh, you know, it's, it's removing this fundamental principle of agency. And so I see then the less valiant or neutral in the war in heaven as a way of getting around the agency problem. Yeah, I like to call those like theological pressure points exactly. that need to be alleviated and that that filled that took care of that pressure point. That's right. It's a way to get around the problem of agency bound up in the curse of Cain because they must have exercised poor agency in the pre existence, therefore the curse is applied to them. Okay, so that's that's Paul Reeve. We're talking with Paul Reeve today. He's associate professor at the University of Utah. We're actually sitting in his office right now uh, with Artis Partial. Paul, we'll come back to you in, in conclusion to talk a little bit about um, when the ban was lifted and the church's more recent statements on race. But I wanted to uh, invite Artis to this interview because she has done so much work on individual Mormons and on Mormon history in her work at the Church History Library on her blog, Keep a Pitchin' In, uh, which is probably the best uh, Mormon history blog with apologies to juvenile instructor uh, that we have online. Uh, it just is a fascinating blog. Many great, uh, inspiring, sometimes difficult, sometimes sad, sometimes amazing stories of Mormons on the ground. Artists, you spend a lot more time with <coughs> regular members of the church and with records that haven't been emphasized in our histories. Uh, why is that? Why focus on that? Probably because so many other people have focused on the leaders, and I can make a contribution by looking at things that other people haven't looked at. I also just find it interesting that people like me had a role in church history, and I like to uncover what that is. How did you first get involved in, in, in doing work in history? came from family history, and I know there's a long-term battle between genealogists and formal historians, but the two can supplement each other quite well. I learned to uncover the kinds of stories about my own ancestors by looking at a newspaper article here, a document there, and putting their stories together, and I apply those same techniques to Mormon history. It's interesting that, uh, from what I understand, you don't have a degree in history, right. right? So what's interesting is most of the books in Mormon history that I've read in the past several years have you in the footnotes, and as a testament to all of the work that you do. So without the formal training, it seems to me you have found a way to put yourself into the historical conversation in ways that make that not matter. You're able to make contributions as what people would call an amateur historian, in ways that are indispensable to the work of professional historians. Well, thanks. Can I get that in writing? Yeah. <laughs> There's your letter of recommendation. <laughs> so let's talk about a particular example from Paul's book. Um, there's an individual that's discussed. Uh, his name is Scipio A. Kenner. Uh, talk about Scipio A. Kenner for a moment. He comes into Paul's story as part of a romance. He was courting Isabel Park, the daughter of Hamilton G. Park, who was one of Brigham Young's business agents. 1869, they had been keeping company, and he proposed to Isabel and was accepted. He's written and gotten permission from the father, who's away on a mission. He's met the mother, Agnes. Agnes is just fine, likes Scipio just very, very well. 
Sometime in the middle of 1870, something happened, though. Isabel's attitude changed. Excuse me, not Isabel, Agnes, the mother's attitude changed. She became convinced that Scipio had black blood, Negro blood, and she no longer want, welcomed him at the house. The couple still kept seeing each other, though, and Agnes got more and more upset to the point where she even struck her daughter Isabel trying to tell her she needed to break this off with Scipio. Somehow she had gotten the notion that he had black blood, and this it's not entirely clear where the idea came from, but I suggest it's because of that middle initial A in Scipio's name. Scipio is named after a, a, a Roman general, Scipio Africanus, and I believe that Agnes got the idea that he was an African. Why did it matter to her? By this point, the hierarchy has has been established, as Paul has been explaining. And if her daughter married into a, a married a, a man with Negro blood, her her grandchildren would not be part of the <laughs> the white hierarchy. Right, they wouldn't hold all the these priesthood. things. Exactly. Yes, all these things that have been talked about as far as what race meant in the nineteenth century would then apply to her family. The degenerate assumption. And she just wouldn't have anything of that. Now, there's a photograph in the book. Where did the photograph come from? Yeah, I, I found that at the uh, Marriott Library at the University of Utah in their special collections. Uh, I, I wanted a picture of uh, Scipio Kenner uh, for the reader to get an indication of what he looked like. Yeah, and he, he looks white. Um, he has curly hair a little bit, though. And Sure. He's a, a, a newspaper man and a mining man, and so he's he's... Became fairly prominent in Utah, but when he was a young man courting Isabel, there was a problem. So that was a turning. That could have been a turning point in his life, right? He's facing the possibility of being if, restricted from the LDS priesthood. If he had been branded as a Negro, then his possibilities of advancement would have been limited to what was available to a Negro, which was which was not very much right. at the time. Um, now, as Paul was looking into that story, you were able to track down some of his descendants. Yes, I, ha I have a habit. People tell me who their ancestors are, and I tend to remember it. And then when I come across materials that I'm searching that I think they'll be interested in, I connect them. Well, I at the time, I had just heard from some people who were descendants of Scipio. At the moment, I can't even remember who they are. But <laughs> when, when it counted, I knew who they were. And what was their reaction? You Obviously, the story was brought to them. Were they... Was it known, well, we, or what was We the, asked a, a, two different branches of the descendant families if they were familiar with this history, and if so, were, the, were there any stories that had passed down in their family? And nobody was aware of it. To me, that that's it's as an historian, it's a little bit disappointing because you missed a story that you might have had. But as a human story, that's a good thing because the stigma did not pass down. They accepted Scipio as a white man, and the problem between him and his mother-in-law didn't stay in the family history. So in the work that you've done um, in assisting other historians, as a historian, you've come across all, a lot of these individual stories that you blog about. Is it difficult to track down these voices? Was it difficult to find uh, uh, descendants of Scipio? I don't have as much trouble finding the stories of individual saints as a lot of historians do, I think because I come from a family history perspective. So many historians start when they've got an important person, when there is a collection of papers, when there's a body of work to start with. I tend to read everything that there is, anything I can put my hands on, and ordinary Latter-day Saints, ordinary Utahns, I do Utah history as well, they're just part of the record. When I find someone who has done something interesting or who has been present in one of those pressure points, then I can research that person the same way I would as if he were my grandfather. You go to the same kinds of records that a genealogist uses, and you turn up all kinds of things that are useful to historians. And sometimes in tracking those people down, they can add uh, even more elements to the story you're telling. Like you said, in this, in the case with Scipio, uh, that memory that was one of the memories that the family chose not to uh, not to pass, to pass on. down that's yes. really really fascinating um, so not only do some stories sort of disappear from individual families that, that don't get passed down but that also happens institutionally as well and Paul was talking about uh, the uh, church leaders sort of 
forgetting certain things about institutional history and creating different narratives in order to shore up uh, what's going on in the present. I, w- I wondered about your uh, response to that happening on that level as it also happens with families. I think that that's a very good point that we sort of drew a curtain over what had happened earlier. Once statehood was granted to Utah and the political pressures were off, the church started sending a lot more people out into the world. We'd always been sending missionaries and a few representatives to Washington and so on. But after the turn of the century, we developed missions elsewhere in the United States, and we began to turn those outposts into real wards and stakes rather than just way stations on the way to Utah. I find that once that happens, Latter-day Saints come into contact a lot more with blacks, and they're not quite sure what to deal to do with them. We had quite a few converts, f- f- black members, in the first 20, 30 years of the 20th century, a lot more than there ever were in the Utah period. And I find that people are writing to church leaders, to their own bishops, to state presidents, asking about what's the policy, what what do we do with these black members? They're welcome for a time in the uh, meetings, but they don't quite know what to do with them. I'm remembering one letter that was written by David McKay, who is uh, the father of David O. McKay. He wants to know whether blacks ha- where they fit into the church hierarchy. I understand that there once was a black priesthood holder, but does that mean hmm. they can hold the? Pri- this was written a, a letter that was written, and I think it was 1910, give or take a year. By that point, he had already forgotten the history. There was a a rumor in the back of his mind, but he'd forgotten. I find letters to mission presidents from members of the church in their mission saying, what about these Negroes who are attending the meetings? In the Northern States mission, a man from Florida wrote about a, a, a woman in the Northern States who was married to a black man, and he was complaining about that. Asel H. Woodruff, who was the mission president, wrote back the first time I have ever seen this used, all are alike unto God, and God cares about the souls of our black brethren as well as he does of the white brethren. But as time went on, as we get into the 19-teens and 1920s, everyone seems to have forgotten that uh, Elijah Abel ever held the priesthood, that Q. Walker Lewis was ever a member of the church. When the subject of black blood comes up, it's only out of curiosity what is our policy? Yeah. Why why don't they why are not why are they not allowed to hold the priesthood? So you see a change there from the kinds of questions that are being asked in the correspondence. Um, those questions change as memory changes. Yes. There are still because there are converts to the church in the United States missions, converts who are black, there are people who ask about their particular cases, but they otherwise it's a, a merely a curiosity. That's Artist Partial. She's an independent historian in Salt Lake City, uh, and she also blogs at Keep Pitching In. Artist, I also wanted you to expand a little bit more on the sort of work that you do on your blog and that you've done at the Church History Library that's history from the ground up, history from everyday members of the church and how you think that fits into the institutional history and the value that you see in stories of individual Mormons that otherwise might be overlooked in the historical record. Well, I think history is little more than the accumulation of experiences of individual people, and in order to recover history, you have to recover those experiences of the people. So again, I read everything I can lay my hands on. Some of the most productive sources that I find are letters, because... People never expect their letters to be read by anyone other than the one they're writing to, and so they're candid. Um, There are minutes of meetings. There are newspaper articles, things that people did not really expect to be preserved or become the subject of study. They record the experiences of individual people, and once I can connect, uh, there's a person who did something interesting or had a difficult experience, then I... research that person's life and put that important experience into context. And it's been useful to people like Paul sometimes to test their theories, to illustrate their theories, to to have the experiences of individual people. It's almost a little bit of detective work, it seems like. Oh, yeah. 
<laughs> That's the fun part. <laughs> I'm not sure I would know what to do if I needed to write a biography, say, of a person who had a large body of papers. To me, the challenge is putting together somebody's story with a, a letter here, a paragraph in the minutes there, a comment in somebody's diary somewhere else. When you read everything, and I tend to take notes by transcribing everything that I read, then it becomes, when I become aware of a person, I can search my magic computer and these isolated parts come together. Indexing and technology. Couldn't do it without modern technology. Yeah. A little bit more I, I want to hear from you on the idea of letters. You mentioned letters is a really important source, and that's obviously something that's changed today. We have email, and that's a little bit more ephemeral, or it seems like, you know, I, you know, I don't know where my emails are stored out there in the we Cloud, assume right? they're stored somewhere, and maybe in 30 years they will be a source that can be searched to our pleasure or shame. But <laughs> at, right now they do seem to be ephemeral, don't they? So what are your thoughts on, on letter writing in general and how that sort of changed? Because the way letters were written, you live now, you email, you know that there, there's a certain conversational style that happens that differs from that type of correspondence. The same kinds of things that we email today, people used to actually put on paper. Are you available at 2 o'clock this afternoon? Okay, I'll be there. So you can reconstruct daily life th th through correspondence the, the way your email reflects. People also tend to write out fully their thoughts on a particular topic. It's like they're carrying on one side of a debate, and then they wait to hear from the, the other person. Yeah, it feels like when I write an email, I, I don't really pay much attention to punctuation i'm not i'm just it's a oh, task it's not like a neither did people in the early 20th century pay any attention so there was to a lot of sloppiness <laughs> but you notice it seems like like collections of letters i've read like you said they'll write out a whole dialogue you know if i'm i don't really do that now um very rarely i think when you tend to discuss things in that level of detail you probably pick up the telephone don't you yeah exactly and so there is no record i i I'll have to leave that to historians 50 years from now to fill in whatever sources they need, but I'm certainly exploiting what's available to me now. I'm going to extend that to Paul, and then we'll swing back to you, okay. artists, just about um, sources, because in your book, you make use of newspapers, letters, uh, political cartoons, all sorts of things. Talk. J I just am interested in the process of soaring through sources like that and, and what it's like to construct a history from so many different types of sources. Yeah, you know, I, I try to cast my net as widely as possible in terms of sources, um, simply because I wanted to understand, you know, uh, was this functioning, this notion of racializing Mormons, believing and somehow um, suggesting that they were less white or more like other marginalized groups, was it functioning at all levels of society? Who was doing it? Um, and so, uh, you know, I, I didn't want to limit my source base to, you know, politicians and speeches in Congress. And I didn't want to limit it to, um, you know, newspapers. I wanted to get at um, as many segments of society as possible to see how widespread it was. First of all, because I was curious. But second of all, I was also anticipating, you know, responses from readers, right? Well, you know, that's interesting. That That's an editorial, but um, it doesn't tell us what the average American thought, right, or, or, or how they responded when they read that editorial. Do they really think that Mormons were less white as a result of that editorial? And that's a question that is ultimately unanswerable for the average American, but I was able to satisfy myself enough by... Um, the variety of sources that I looked at, that this, in fact, permeated all levels of American society. So, you know, um, overland travel diaries and journals, uh, congressional speeches, Supreme Court decisions, presidential speeches, newspaper editorials, Protestant tracts. Um, you know, I got a, a, a fellowship at the Huntington Library. They have a collection of anti-Mormon Protestant tracts, and I, I read those. And actually, a lot of the categories that I used emerged from that initial uh, research trip to the Huntington Library. Uh, and so I, I really became satisfied that it did permeate all segments of American society. And, you know, one thing that sort of made this study possible in terms of the wide swath of sources I was able to look at is just the remarkable digitization that's taken place in the last even 10 years. So that, you know, national newspapers um, are keyword searchable now. And, you know, I couldn't imagine trying to get at this same level of sources through microfilm. Um, and so I was 
fortunate enough that my source base was, uh, you know, sustained by um, digital archives that are now more readily available. Um, it didn't alleviate me from actually going into actual archives and reading um, the primary sources itself, but would I be able to have pulled off this kind of um, kind of source gathering, uh, you know, even 10 years ago? I, I would not have, and I'm really fortunate on that count. Um, but, you know, it, I was sort of driven by this, this um, desire to get as wide an indication of how f- much this permeated American society, and I was surprised myself uh, because... You know, it, it just sort of, once once you knew, knew what to look for, it, it just seemed to permeate um, a variety of different mediums and a variety of different sort of um, levels of American society. But while Paul is casting his net as broadly as he did, I want to say that he didn't neglect the ordinary research that should always be done. One of the things that impressed me about his research is that he didn't rely on earlier accounts of Mormon history. He went back to the original sources. He tracked down everybody's footnotes. And by doing that, he was able not only to verify, but to make some slight corrections and also to discover material on the same page as quotations that have been cited over and over, but somehow were missed. Paul, um, before the interview, you were talking about uh, an interesting correction to the historical record that you were able to make in this book. Um, For people who have read about issues of uh, race and the priesthood and Mormonism, your book brings some important, very important new things to the table. For example, uh, previous scholarship had made the claim that the first known statement specifically about blacks and the priesthood was in 1849, and you found reason to question that, so uh, with a little help from uh, artists as well. So I was hoping that you two could talk about that for a moment. So uh, previous scholarship had suggested that for Brigham Young, the first statement of a priesthood restriction was 1849, and they were relying upon the journal history, which is basically um, you know a daily account uh, of events in Mormonism, uh, and um, I certainly knew that there was reason to question the journal history because sometimes the uh, the scholars or the I should say the historians in the church uh, historians office in the 19th century would um, sometimes many years later uh, create these entries and and first um, they were making the Brigham Young's manuscript minutes and then using those to create the journal history um, minutes and. I wanted to get at the original minutes for that 1849 meeting, and uh, so this is nothing uh, in terms of denigrating previous scholars because they didn't have access to those original minutes. And this is um, an indication of, you know, the more openness that is available um, that I was able to uh, uh, partake of that previous scholars weren't. Uh, I went back to the original minutes that were taken by uh, Bullock for that 1849 meeting, and the meeting is basically centered on um, Lorenzo Snow making a case, it says, for, um, uh, for, for blacks within Mormonism. Uh, unfortunately, the minutes are very sparse, and which, this is typical of Thomas Bullock and, and his minute-keeping. Uh, they don't give us an indication of the kind of case that Lorenzo Snow laid out, unfortunately. Uh, but as I read the minutes for that 1849 meeting, I was struck that they don't, in fact, in the original, include any indication of priesthood. It's simply an enunciation of Brigham Young's standard explanation that black blackness is tied to a curse of Cain and Cain killing Abel. But uh, the original minutes didn't say anything about a priesthood restriction, and therefore... It was about uh, slavery, <clears throat> right? Well, it's about, um, you know, the place of blacks, like who are they and their sort of racial identity. And it is sort of Brigham Young's um, uh, what he will articulate more elaborately in 1852, but his notion that um, because Cain killed Abel, Cain's descendants will will be prevented uh, or or are, are, I should say, cursed. Um, And what is missing is any sort of notion of a racial priesthood restriction in those original minutes. And I was really struck by that, and it seemed really important. And so then I wanted to figure out, well, how did that notion of a priesthood restriction make it into the manuscript history and then the journal history, which scholars have relied upon to suggest that that was, in fact, the first articulation by Brigham Young of a racial priesthood restriction? And so I obviously sent off um, uh, uh, 
an email to artists and they said, hey, can uh, any insights into how this would have made it in a priesthood restriction would have made it into the manuscript minutes when it's not, in fact, in the original minutes uh, recorded by Thomas Bullock? I knew from previous work that the manuscript history was not written contemporaneous to events. It's something that, that was written later. So we wanted to track down exactly when those minutes were recorded. One of the sources that I like to use is the Historian's Office Journal, kept in the 19th century. The journal is really just a record of what each historian in the office worked on that day, and occasionally some notes about the weather and who else dropped into town. So I started going through looking for the period when they were working on 1849 history and discovered that in 1861, John Jacks was assigned to do scrapping. In other words, scrapbooking. He's searching newspapers and diaries and so on and pasting together the raw materials for what they will write as the manuscript history. He's doing that in 1861, covering the month in 1849 that, that is of concern. So I, by that, we can tell that what is recorded, including that phrase about the priesthood, is not necessarily the state of Mormon thought in 1849. It's what John Jacks and his associates considered the state of Mormon philosophy in 1861. Cool. That's Artist Partial. She co-edited a book with Paul Reeve called Mormonism, a Historical Encyclopedia. We're speaking today with Artis and Paul. He's the author of Religion of a Different Color, and he's professor of history at the University of Utah. I wanted to get a little bit more personal for the final segment here, because, Paul, you're a practicing member of the LDS Church, and you wrote this book, Religion of a Different Color, that touches on things that are difficult. I'm, I'm a member of the church, and some of the things were difficult to read. Um, when you see church leaders of the past making statements that, that seem to my 21st century uh, sensibilities to be racist, and um, they're unsettling. And so with the benefit of hindsight, I think church members today can encounter some of the things in your book, say Brigham Young's thoughts on interracial marriage, for example, and feel uncomfortable. And, you know, the, the, the problem is this is a person, Brigham Young, who's president of the church, uh, and in, in many ways he was a person of his time, as you mentioned. He was also a complex person. Um, as far as thinking prophetically, Mormons might wonder why LDS prophets weren't more ahead of schedule when it comes to race relations. You noted that Mormonism had the seeds of a universalistic perspective, and they didn't really bear fruit in early Mormonism, and some people might wonder uh, why that was the case if you have prophets, why they weren't taking advantage of that. Um, You sum up the problem like this. You write, the Mormon story lays bare in all of its ugly and naked defenselessness, the self-interested and manipulative nature of racial identity construction. At least a portion of the Mormon effort to gain acceptance and legitimacy thus came at the expense of other marginalized groups. So as an active member of the church, I'd like to hear how you reckon with these difficult questions. Yeah, they are difficult questions, and uh, they are uncomfortable, and, and I, I hope it does cause some discomfort, in fact. I, I think um, as, as Latter-day Saints, we need to confront um, you know, uh, the good and the bad in our historical past, and it's only at staring it straight in the face that we can come to terms with it and create a better future, I think. I think history has a service to, 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 to play in that regard, and uh, in my estimation, it's really healthy to get it all out, get it out in the open, uh, and to grapple with it. Uh, for me, um, the best part is just allowing Mormons to be human, allowing Mormons in the pew to be human, and allowing um, Mormons at the pulpit and in the leadership roles to be human. And uh, despite their humanness, you know, uh, uh, they are able to accomplish pretty remarkable things, and it's really a compelling story. But um, I personally don't see uh, the priesthood and temple restrictions as coming from God. I see God allowing them to happen. In other words, he didn't come down in person and stop Brigham Young from saying his terribly racist things. He allowed it to happen, uh, just like he allowed uh, the children of Israel to have a king when they asked for a king, and he recommended otherwise, and then let them suffer, suffer the consequences, just like he allowed Joseph Smith to hand Martin Harris the 116 pages and then let 
him suffer the consequences. Just like he uh, didn't stop Joseph Smith from founding uh, an anti-baking society in Kirtland and then let him suffer the consequences. Uh, you know, um, I know because we have, as practicing Latter-day Saints, a first vision, um, we have this notion of, you know, an interventionist God. And certainly um, I don't disagree that God um, appeared to Joseph Smith. I'm, I'm a believing Latter-day Saint. But it sometimes gives rise to the notion that God is a micromanager and every finger lift by uh, his leadership team is somehow controlled as a puppet master. Um, And I don't think God allows for the violation of that fundamental principle of agency, and he gives prophets agency as well. And I see Brigham Young and the Mormon leadership responding to circumstances on the ground and it taking on a life of its own so that it becomes deeply entrenched in Mormonism. And it is tragic. And uh, when they become so convinced that it's based upon God, not upon man, it becomes even more tragic because they feel righteously justified in discriminating against their own black members. Uh, and when anytime you put a policy in place and it's supported by doctrine, like this priesthood and temple restriction was, that is simply based upon skin color and righteousness can't have anything to do with it. It's inherently racist. And we need to come to terms with that. There are no excuses. And I think the 21st century church has done better at coming to grips with that. And there have been statements that um, all that, that the church today condemns racism, all racism, past and present, inside and outside the church. And I think we should come to terms with what that actually means, so that any time a black person was denied temple admission or denied the priesthood, it's now been condemned by the 21st century church. It's a condemnation. We've condemned all racism in and out of the church, past and present, and that includes LDS leaders. It's now been condemned. We shouldn't try to justify it. It was wrong. And, uh, you know, there's a new path forward. There's a really interesting statement from Spencer W. Kimball uh, that I, I don't recall seeing before. It's a quote that says, the doctrine or policy on blacks in the priesthood and the temple has not varied in my memory. I know it could. I know the Lord could change his policy and release the ban and Forgive the possible error which brought about the deprivation. Yeah, that's 1963 um, when Spencer W. Kimball was an apostle, and I think it signals a remarkable open attitude that he is open to the possibility. He's open to the possibility that was in, that it was in fact an error, and I think you know it sort of took that kind of open attitude for when he was president of the church to question. And when the revelation comes to him, he says that he is basing this upon the promises made by previous prophets. And up to that point, the promises made by previous prophets that the then current generation of leaders were focusing on were the promises of a cursed priesthood and temple restriction. Kimball chooses to focus on the promises that there will be a day of future redemption. And that's what he focuses on, and he's open to the possibility that it was an error. And as early as 1963, he's open to that possibility. So I think that's a fundamental component to um, also sort of uh, the revelation that that is received in 1978, is that you have a person at the helm who is open to um, those attitudes and those possibilities. Obviously, there are a variety of other components that come into play, but um, it seems that Kimball's attitude that he signals in 1963 is, is important to think about as well. Artis, I wanted to ask you the same question uh, that Paul just talked about, and that's how you uh, have dealt with these sort of questions about imperfect leaders and uh, your faith. It may be a little simplistic, but I firmly believe in that whole idea of line upon line, precept on precept. I don't think that a perfect gospel with perfect understanding was suddenly bestowed on Joseph Smith on April 6, 1830. I think that we continue to learn new things, but we also continue to correct past mistakes. I think that the safest course is to follow what the prophets say. Otherwise, I'm pitting my judgment against them 
and it's their calling in these matters. But we do continue to learn and grow, and that's how I face problems of the past. That's Artist Partial. She is an independent historian in Salt Lake City, and she co-edited a book called Mormonism, a Historical Encyclopedia. And we also spoke today with Paul Reeve, Associate Professor of History at the University of Utah. He's the author of the new book, Religion of a Different Color, Race, and the Mormon Struggle for Whiteness from Oxford University Press. Thanks for joining us today, Paul. Thank you, Blair. It was my pleasure. And thanks to you too, artists. Thanks, Blair.